and now the reaction really is finished. A, a couple minutes ago, I was trying to move on to the next reaction when we weren't done with this one. So we saw there's a bunch of reactions that can happen here. Why is it so easy to miss the reactions here? Because it's easy not to notice how the acid can give you a better nucleophile and a better electrophile. So earlier we saw how if we started with the ether, we protonate the ether to make it into a better leaving group, and that reveals the bromide as a nucleophile, and that gave us an alcohol and a haloalkane. But then we basically just went through that whole process all over again. If we still have excess hydrobromic acid, we can protonate the oxygen again. And that, again, makes it into a better leaving group. Now, it was good here that you saw that the bromide was not attacking the oxygen directly. We've seen that positive charges generally, uh, except for carbocations, positive charges don't make that particular atom into an electrophile. They make the adjacent atom into the electrophile. So this alpha carbon became the electrophile. And the water here was the leaving group. So this was very similar to the first attack on the ether. And that gave us our other halo alkane here. So we have to watch out for this idea that in these reactions there could be, uh, this is one of the hardest things in organic chemistry, knowing when you're done. Oftentimes people stop too soon. So you have to watch out and make a clear note in your notes here that when we have this type of attack on an ether, if we have enough of the, hi uh, enough of the hydrohalogen, we can have two sets of reactions. First we make the alcohol, and then we protonate the alcohol to go through the reaction again. Okay. That's a good start. That's fine, except for the most important part of the picture, which is the charges. Let's make sure we got the charges right under intermediate. That's right. The charge really is the most important part of the picture. You have to get into the habit of putting that in. Now you're proposing that the iodide could attack this carbon here on the left, treating this as the alpha carbon. Yeah. That seems very reasonable. What type of mechanism would that be? It would be an SN2. SN2. How do you know? Um, because we have a methyl and we have a, a negative iodide, so it's SN2. It's going to proceed. Okay, to that's fine. Now and there's it, someone else who... Gonna, I'm sorry. Uh, because of... Uh, I considered the... Uh, is that a terpio? Yeah, this is a terpio. It was just uh, too much steric hindrance for an SN2 to take place if, uh, was if the methyl mm -hmm. and the oxygen were to leave. That's an important consideration. Let's think about that a little bit more. So you were considering whether this could be the alpha carbon. Could we do an SN2 on this alpha carbon? No. No, you're right, because there's too much steric hindrance. Could we do an SN1? Yeah. 
Yeah, so we can't reject this completely. Sure. We just have to do an SN1 here. So it seems like the iodide could attack this left-hand carbon with an SN2, mm -hmm. or the iodide could attack the right-hand carbon in an SN1. I would think that you might get both of those mechanisms, but looking at your instructor's lecture notes, he actually only attacked the right-hand carbon. He only attacked the right-hand carbon. I'm not, uh, may, I'm not sure if that's because he's just ignoring this reaction, or maybe this one reaction, ha reaction happens first. Mm -hmm. but let's follow along with what your instructor was doing. Let's show what the mechanism would look like if the iodide attacks the right-hand carbon. Now, what mechanism would that be? It's going to be an SN1. Because this is tertiary. Yeah, so this will give so us a chance to review SN1. So let's draw what that would look like. So we'll have to erase your first thought of attacking the left-hand carbon. That would have been my thought, too, but that's not what your instructor does. So let's show what would happen with an SN1 on the right-hand carbon. Don't forget the arrow here showing how the iodide picked up its electrons. Looks like you left oh, out yeah, yeah, yeah. this arrow. Okay. That's fine. Here we're attacking a alpha carbon, a tertiary alpha carbon. So we have to do an SN1 reaction, not an SN2. And then we're able to use the iodide to attack this carbocation. Good. And I think I got all the charges right. Yes, you did. That's good. Now, suppose we have excess hydroiodic acid. Okay. If there were excess hydroiodic acid, can you see anything else that could now happen? Yes. Um, where would it, like, if I had this on my paper, where would I put just right here, or, or could I do? At this point, just. Because it's going to react with this molecule, I'm just going to write it over here. Okay. All right. We know what do what does what do acids like to do? They like to break. show the electron pushing arrows for that step. Okay, that's fine. And that gives us this. And 
town to decide if there's another step. Yes, there is. We can do an SN2 reaction. Good. How do you know it'll be SN2 and not SN1? Because uh, we're on a methyl. Right. Now there's no steric hindrance at all. So even though the first reaction we did was SN1, this one makes sense as SN2. Again, as usual, now we've learned it would be tempting to think that this positive charge makes the oxygen electrophilic, but it actually makes the oxygen a leaving group and it makes the adjacent atom electrophilic. Uh, 